Right, everybody who's watching this live or you're watching the replay as part of Accounts Payable Appreciation Week for 2023, I am delighted to be joined by my co fellow colleagues and co-hosts today, Mary Schaefer and Lynn Larson. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in a second. But as a reminder, if you've got questions throughout the session, um, if you're brave enough, we'll allow you one. You can bring your video on, you can ask the question live, or if you want to put it in the chat area, I think there's a chat uh, to your right-hand side. Um, the whole session today is around the, the marketing title that says Accelerate Payments and Grow Your Business. But look, I have two of the world's gurus when it comes to accounts payable procurements, uh, procure to pay and payments and cards. Um, so we will go wherever this conversation takes us. Um, so I'm delighted to firstly introduce Mary. Mary, please tell everybody about yourself, who, who you are and where you work. So hi, I'm Mary Schaefer from AP Now, and uh, I'm uh, from the East Coast in the United States. And um, you know we talk about everything related to accounts payable. And to be perfectly honest, we have a wonderful audience and I'm really lucky. And you know through this work, I've gotten to work with Jamie Radford, um, a, for quite a bit. And also even longer than I've worked with Jamie, I've worked with Lynn Lawson, who I think you're going to be delighted when she, you hear what she has to share. So Lynn, you want to introduce yourself? Well, that's a big buildup, Mary. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hi, Lynn Larson, as Jamie and Mary have mentioned. I am the founder of Recharged Education, which is basically a, a consulting firm. And I offer uh, educational resources, consulting, training, you name it within the realm of B2B business to business payments uh, with a particular focus on commercial cards, P cards, travel cards, virtual cards. So happy to be here. Thank you, Lynn. And for those who don't know who I am, my name is Jamie Radford. I'm the founder of the Accounts Payable Association uh, based in the UK, but we sort of have a global audience also. We're delighted to work with Mary and we've worked with Lynn also previously. And both Lynn and Mary sit on the top 100 influencers for 2022-23. We've got that coming up, ladies. So we'll find out whether you've made the list this year. Um, we, I'm sure you will. Uh, but look, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. And let's kick off straight away, if we can, around the, type, the, the topic and the title about payments. Um, we were on, just as a sort of a, a, a backdrop for this, I was on a session a few weeks ago with a lot of the influencer community, and the conversation steered its way towards payments generally about the complexity, the cost, the cost in the UK uh, predominantly is going up in terms of making faster payments, back payments, all these good things. Um, and a lot of the people that were on this call actually didn't even know there was alternative methods of making payments. You know, they, they assumed it was the standard way that they'd always been heard of and, and sort of told about. And Mary and, and uh, Lynn, in the US, is that similar? I know that you have this big no-no around checks, the manual checks, but we, we won't go into massive detail there. But um, is there an educational breakdown in terms of the types of payments that are available for the world of accounts payable? So in the US, we have a number of different types of uh, payments that are used on a regular basis basis by companies. As uh, Jamie alluded to, we have still have a lot of paper checks. And Jamie, I was chuckling to myself as I was running to get my coffee. And I was thinking about what you said about how backs has gotten so much more expensive. And I thought, you know what, if the UK banks aren't careful, they're going to find people going back to paper checks, because um, the costs that you were talking about kind of equate to what we pay for for wire transfers. But as an alternative to wire transfers, we have what we call ACH, same day or next day, which are quite a lot less expensive. And of course, cards, uh, P cards, travel cards, virtual cards. And I would be remiss if I even tried to talk about them because Lynn is such an expert. So Lynn, why don't you tell people a little bit about cards? Well, they all fall under the commercial card umbrella is what I say. And, okay. you know, just real quickly, I mean, we know there are so many different iterations and part of the problem when it comes to the education around cards is oftentimes um, people are using the same term for different things. And so there's a whole uh, terminology element that uh, often gets overlooked and, and you can enter into conversations, not realizing that the other person is talking about something different. <laughs> uh, but when it comes to purchasing cards, P cards, Pro cards, you know, whatever short term, uh, you know, abbreviation you want to use. You know, those are ideal for a lot of these small dollar payments that really clog up accounts payable. Uh, so, you know, that's a great tool for that purpose. 
Then you have the whole world of travel cards, you know, obviously, as the name implies, uh, you know, for em uh, employees, business travel expenses, you know, maybe we'll get into that. I don't know. That's a whole nother topic, Jamie. But, uh, you know, and then you think about the world of virtual cards. And despite the fact that they have been around now for decades, really, um, you still are running into a lot of organizations that aren't even aware and you know, virtual cards um, tend to be housed in accounts payable or accounts payable manages them. And it's a good tool uh, when you're talking about those invoice payments. And so in many cases, they might sort of compete with the ACH um, options that Mary just mentioned. And, and so that's where I think organizations have to really take a, a close look at you know, what they're buying, how they're buying it, and what payment method is you know, most advantageous, not just for you, the buyer, but also for your suppliers um, and, and figure out a payment strategy that can literally save you money. And, and look, I mean, again, so if I can pick up, that's, that's a, a exceptional, thank you, Lynn. And that one about what we would call in the UK tail spend management. So it's that Pareto, isn't it? So it's, yeah. you know, it's 80% of the volume is in that little, in that tail. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Let's talk a little bit about that. And Mary, you, you've, you and I have spoken about this I would say that's where the risk is also. It's where, uh -huh. the tickets, where the errors, where the fraud is. I mean, again, if we delve into that a little bit. So, Mary, you know, in the US, do you have the same issue in that that sort of risk? Yeah, element? yeah because it, it goes, you know, you don't want to spend all your resources looking at, you know, $100 or £100 payments. But at the same time, if you make that payment two or three times, or it's for something that, you know, you really shouldn't have paid it for, it adds up. Um, we see this problem, I see it anyway, as potentially growing. Um, in the US, we have this huge issue right now, and I don't know if you have it in the UK, perhaps you can chime in, but because everybody is now emailing invoices, and in fact, over 70% of invoices are now emailed, we're seeing uh, suppliers who will email into two or three different uh, people within the organization. And so even though accounts payables told set up this one uh, email mail address for invoices, there's many, many copies of it. And when you have this increase in the number of invoices, first of all, it increases the work and accounts payable because it takes some time and effort to weed it out, even if you're 100 percent accurate. But let's face it, nobody's 100 percent accurate. And so sometimes they get paid. They tend to get paid more than once. And so I can see the problem of duplicate invoices leading to more duplicate payments payments, especially on that low dollar amount, because let's face it, how much time are you going to spend looking at a $100 or a $200 invoice? And you know, um, the crooks are going to take advantage of this. Lynn, do you see some of that going on? Well, I think, you know, one thing with with P cards, you know, or purchasing cards, right. taking up that tail spend, um, you know, then you also still have to be careful about those duplicates, you know, as you were mentioning, Mary, um, you know, and, and in a perfect world, once you make the decision to use a P card to pay a supplier, you would not also pay the same supplier through another another method, hopefully cutting down on the possibility of invoices um, landing in AP. But you know that it's not a perfect world. No. <laughs> and, you know, there, there certainly are situations where you have designated a P card for everything under a certain dollar, uh, dollar mm -hmm. amount. But then inevitably you get uh, an expense with that same supplier that's quite substantial and the organization might want to pay it uh, another way. Although P cards can be used for any dollar amount as long as the supplier will take it. But you, you just have to be very careful at, at how you set up your systems and the controls in place for catching duplicates. Um, you know, we, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that, you know, without getting too deep. And maybe Jamie, you can chime in if you're seeing that struggle um, over there with, you know, the division of payments and duplicates. Yeah, I, th I think the, uh, look, it, will we ever get rid of duplicates and fraud? I don't, I doubt it. But again, I think, you know, from the UK and Europe's perspective, we've got lots of what we would call compensating controls. We've got a lot of things that check. The problem with a compensating control is it's control after the, the, the effect. Yeah. <laughs> a fraud's happened, a duplicate's happened, then we go and find it. Um, we, we need to focus more on the front end, you know. The, upfront controls. The upfront controls. And I think, Lynn, what you were saying around using P cards to sort of manage that, that tail spend absolutely helps you to then focus your time, like Mary said, 
on the, the greater value invoices, the, the more challenging suppliers and the relationships. And what I would suggest is that, again, in the UK, P cards are, have been around for a while. So are virtual cards. But definitely in the UK and Europe, they're not really used to the greatest effect. You know, things like we were talking just before we went live about um, rebates, supply rebates. Um, look, in, in the UK, we have vendors that market turn accounts payable into a profit center. Oh, we do uh, too. We do yeah. too. Makes yeah. me crazy. Absolutely. You know, look, we would never be a profit center, unfortunately, but it's it's a bit of marketing. But actually, if if you use P cards, virtual cards or T&E cards to, to the right effect, you can absolutely um, make a payment to a supplier um, take the credit terms that that's effectively given to you for settling the credit, you know, the credit card or the payment card, but also give the money up front to the supplier, which then in turn, hopefully, and Lynn, you correct me if I'm wrong, maybe gives some sort of rebate if there's a volume or a payment. Is that how it works in the US and, and across the globe? Yeah. Well, yeah. well, actually, though, you just said in the US and across the globe, and you distinguish between the two, which was very clever on your part, because rebates, also known as revenue share um, from card usage, are not the same between the U.S. and the rest of the world. And, and so it's interesting, Jamie, that you made that that, that separation. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely uh, a, an element that an organization should be discussing, uh, whether with yeah. their current card issuer, if they have one, or if they're embarking on, uh, you know, implementing uh, one or more types of card programs. And, you know, every issuer is different. Every accounts payable buying organization is different. And, you know, revenue share rebates um, are tied to um, anything from how much is that organization putting on the card. So obviously, uh, you know, that overall spend. And then there might be elements about the, um, you know, speed of payment, you know, back to the issuer when, when the time comes. And, you know, some different factors that go into it. But now you have to think back to where does that money come from? And, you know, it's because suppliers are paying a, a fee related to card acceptance. And part of the fee, you know, is known as, as interchange or an interchange fee. Uh, and, you know, the, the amount varies so much. Um, and that yeah. depends on the supplier and the supplier's business and their volume. And it's so complex and I think, you know, in the AP world, you can't automatically assume that, oh, we use cards and we're going to get X percent of a rebate back because that's just not true. It really depends on, um, you know, the interchange involved with the transaction, which, again, it, it's dependent on a lot of factors on the supplier side. And, you know, I know especially uh, Europe and, and, you know, more broadly, just anywhere other than the U.S., has lower interchange rates typically than in the US. And so with that in mind, um, there are typically lower uh, rebate amounts available to buying organizations to AP than what you see in the US. Um, that, that's a whole nother topic we could talk about probably for an hour, but. So Lynn, I'm listening to you. Um, and I know one of the objections that companies in the US will have sometimes is that you know, with the um, interchange rate, um, they don't mind taking the card on a small dollar transaction, but on a large do dollar transaction, it starts to get, you know, dicey because, you know, they see it as a lot of money. And, and I understand that, believe me. But if I'm listening to you, that will be less of an issue in Europe because it should interchange, be because the interchange rates are lower. Right. It, it should be. And I have to just, you know, kind of put an asterisk on yeah. everything I say as well. It depends. And, and what are we looking at? In, and what in my opinion. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, but, you know, even in the United States, I mean, the issuers and, and the, those on the provider side of the world, when we're, ta when we're talking about cards, I mean, they've tried to make it um, more cost effective to suppliers for those larger dollar amounts. And so there are some different programs in place that if a supplier you know, meets the designated criteria, which is always changing, mm -hmm. uh, they can have some really low rates on larger transactions you know, to help entice them to accept card payments for higher and higher dollar amounts. And you know, even back the early part of my career, I was managing a card program. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were willing to use cards 
P cards for everything. And there were some big suppliers that would even accept a card payment on, you know, $50,000. I mean, it was just astronomical. Right. right. Um, now, did we get a large rebate on that? Not necessarily. Again, it, it depends on, you know, what, what's involved and what the contract is um, for your card program. But you're right, Mary. I mean, we have to continuously focus on what is also going to work for the supplier. And so, right. Jamie, I don't know if that's what you're hearing in the UK too, that suppliers are hesitant or is there a lot of um, angst about pursuing cards because of that? I think, yeah, I think it's a mix of both. I think, I think there's a bit of education. I think there's, you know, both from the businesses who could use uh, cards for, for payments and also the suppliers, you know, that if, if, there's, a, if there's a charge somewhere, Who's paying it? Is it the supplier? Right. Is it the you know? Is it the customer effectively? So I think there's a bit of education. And if you like, let, let's turn this on its head. Um, let's be controversial. Let's, this is a good time to be controversial. Why wouldn't businesses use cards to make those small small dollar payments or small uh, GB payments? I mean, the reality comes down to I assume there's some element of risk to making a payment via card. So there's a set of rules. There's a transactional risk. You know that you've got to control the transactions. Um, and then there's also the legislation part, I'd imagine, where you've got to get the right uh, documents from the countries you pay. But, you know, Lynn, Mary, what, what's your thoughts? I mean, again, I'm listening here, sitting here listening to Lynn, thinking it makes sense for businesses to try and do away with these small values. So, dollar. so you know what I hear? I would say in the U.S., about 80 percent of the companies take credit cards take of some sort. And it, it's been that way for a while, and the number doesn't seem to be increasing. And when you talk to people, you hear things like, well, our CFO is afraid that people would use uh, the card for personal purchases. They figure we'd have, think it'd have fraud. And I'm thinking to myself when I hear this, why are you hiring people who you don't trust? Okay. At the end, I mean, I want to, I don't say that because it's a tacky thing to say, but I really want to yell at people, why, you know, and I think it's a misplaced fear. Yeah, somebody's going to use it incorrectly, but it's going to, it's going to be few and far between. Lynn, uh, I'm going to stop ranting and raving and let you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, there there are a few things here. So, um, you know, the the fraud element. You know, yeah. uh, you have to again. I don't want to speak to every individual contract because right. I don't, I can't. Um, but generally speaking, there are protections for the um, buying organization whereby one, if it's external fraud and a cardholder looks at their statement and they see something, they have no idea what it is and, and, and whatnot. I didn't you know, they buy can, that. Exactly. Uh, you know, so you can, you know, obviously report that and, and, and you know, get your money back and, and not be liable. Just, you know, like we are as consumers by and large. Uh, and when it comes to that internal element of potential cardholders um, making a personal purchase, well, that too, there are usually some protections in place or uh, things offered by the card issuers that can protect the organizations from those employees that, according to Mary, you shouldn't have hired anyway if you didn't <laughs> trust them. But, you know, <laughs> right, right. Uh, you know, so there are protections there, uh, you know, and, and even when we were talking earlier about the duplicates, you know, again, if you find that, you know, you have paid a supplier via, say, a P card as well as through um, a, a AP method, you know, non-card method, you know, you can, you know, go back and dispute that card transaction, dispute that duplicate, and hopefully then, you know, get your money back. So um, there, there are so many protections, you know, on, at that level. But I do think, um, from my understanding, the, in, in, beyond the U.S., beyond North America, there are maybe some steps that um, European, UK organizations could be taking to further improve the foundational elements of a P-card program. You know, it's like kind of really stepping back and saying, do we have all the different controls in place? Do we have clear policies and procedures? Have we identified the roles, the responsibilities? Are we willing to hold people accountable? Uh, do we have an auditing element, you know, that that can help catch um, anything perhaps that is not correct? You know, and there are so many different factors that go into just the, a strong card program. If you build it correctly, and you can make adjustments even after, you know, you've really gotten going with cards, but right. if you build it correctly, I mean, you shouldn't have the tons of problems that some organizations envision. You right. know, so there's you think an it's, it's it's more imaginary than actual. 
Like, do they fear something that's worse than actually would happen? Well, and, and that, com- that comes into it too, because if you read industry articles out there, at least in the US, there are so many articles about P-card fraud. And by and large, they are saying it's coming from public sector organizations, you know, like at a government or, or higher uh, education institution. And that's not because they're worse than the private sector, but they're the ones that land in the news because of their right. public sector status. And um, uh, freedom of information. We have free, something called Freedom of Information Act over here. Uh, right, right. And, and so, I you know, it, you. yeah, it, it, it does play with um, controllers' minds or CFOs' minds. And you just still, again, if you go through and have a well-built, well-built program with internal controls, you're far minimizing the risk. But I will say, and I don't even know, Jamie, if you want to go here, but, you know, one of the biggest challenge, at least, um, you know, over in the in the UK or in Europe in general, is the VAT challenges. Oh. And I don't want to <laughs> talk about that. I'm, I'm not, um, so I don't feel qualified, let, but it's let's a throw it back. Let's throw it back to him. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> you, you asked, why wouldn't they use P cards? That's a challenge they have yeah. to overcome. So. But I think, I think Lynn, you know, it's, you're right, absolutely. I mean, in the UK, yeah, tax, VAT, uh, that is... I consider it as a challenge, but it's one that can be overcome. And I think that organizations that just don't do things because of a challenge, obviously are they the right type of organization. So yes, VAT in the UK, although it's not very complex, it's not like in the States where you have oh, um, God. <laughs> masses of legislation, you have masses of tax tax issues. We have one standard usually, um, but it is it is a blocker. Um, but if, if we turn this on its head again, so... This is part of a Cancer Pebble Appreciation Week. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in live. And thank you for the people watching this on replay. Um, again, look, the whole thing this week is about celebrating accounts payable, procure to pay folk. Lynn, you wrote a blog um, that both myself and Mary have looked, commented on. Uh, you, you're constantly promoting best practice, and, and so is Mary, clearly. Um, the blog itself is about how AP folk can really help themselves? What's the best practice? So I'm going to open the floor to the two experts. How can AP get involved in making payments more effective? What parts of the process can get involved? Because this is all about collaboration. So open the floor to both, please. Well, Mary, do you want to go ahead? He effectively steered the conversation. Yeah, so what I like to (laughs) tell people, I'm just going to talk a little, and then I'm going to throw it back to you, so don't think you're getting off the hook. Um, So so what um, we like to tell people and I think this is true regardless of what country that you're in. Take a look at your payments. How many payments do you have? How are you, how are you making them? For us, how many are checks? How many are cards? How many are ACH? Uh, how many are wire transfer? And then you, get a, you know where you are. And then you not only want to look at how many, but what is the dollar amount? And you know, our big uh, push here now is those chat, those. Uh, portion of payments that are paper checks that are under $100, $250, or $500, just to get them onto cards, which is where I think they belong. And so, you know, for the European audience, just think pounds, euros, whatever your own currency is. Um, we have the, the same 80-20 rule. Um, it, it might even be, you know, even worse than that. Um, and then decide how, how you want them to go. Lynn, I know you've got a lot of suggestions on how to get, uh, how accounts payable specifically can get involved in the card process. And maybe this would be a good time if you don't mind to share that. No, of course, that it's a great topic. And Jamie, you were indicating that you have a live event coming up where you want to discuss accounts payable and procurement, you know, working uh, more closely together. And, and that's a huge part of, of this. Um, I think AP can be leaders in initiating that relationship. Um, you know, I think historically AP doesn't get enough credit or, you know, besides the credit aspect, they're not given enough, you know, opportunities to really shine. You know, they're sort of pigeonholed into this area of make your payments, process invoices, and that's what you do. But I think even if not given an outright invitation or opportunity, that AP can step up to say, hey, you know, I have done an analysis of our payments, as Mary just suggested, and I see that we've got this clear, uh, you know, separation between, you know, what we consider low value or high value, uh, you know, and, and initiate a discussion around how can we make things more efficient. 
because, you know, on the, on the other side of the, of the table with procurement, I mean, sometimes they get stuck rubber stamping purchase, um, you know, re, uh, purchase requests, requisitions, making purchase orders for things they know nothing about, and they're just stamping things and moving them along. So it's about both sides realizing that they can add far more value to an organization if you can take care of some of the tail spend or most of the tail spend. But as Mary said, start at lower dollar amounts and just keep working your way up until you hit a point where you feel like you've got a good separation. But then if procurement is not rubber stamping things, they can be more strategic in selecting suppliers, you know, getting contract terms, um, you know, in place that address that whole purchase to pay process and, and how things will work and, and, and the timing and so forth. And accounts payable can work on, you know, what are the metrics? How much are we spending? Are we meeting uh, internal goals related to days payable outstanding or, um, you know, kind of extending the float or the working capital? And, and both sides can just be doing more for an organization if both are not so caught up in addressing that low dollar spend. And so I think AP can just take the lead and, and say, let's do this and, and bring people together. So Lynn, can I throw back something at you um, that uh, we have, we, we seem to have stopped talking about in the United States, but I think is a great way to entice, uh, to get other departments to either increase what they're doing on cards or to entice them to get a program in the first place. So uh, we talk, I wanna go back to the rebate um, so two questions, typically what happens to the rebate within a company and number two, could accounts payable or procurement share that like could accounts payable and AP, uh, and procurement share that as a way to get everybody excited about, uh, using cards. Um, well, sure. I mean, organizations can do whatever they want. Um, yeah. You know, some of it depends on their internal accounting rules, you know, obviously, mm -hmm. and, and how do they handle things. I mean, most organizations, at least in the US, tend to book rebates received at just a high, high level. Um, but you could put some things in place, as you're mentioning, Mary, to entice both sides. But I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that um, not so much focusing on the rebate, although I know you want to. I love to. Um, <laughs> I know, I know, because it's it's tangible. It, it, oh, it's right. really see people it. like it. But I think too, putting some goals around mm -hmm. um, process savings, you know, and and that's harder. I realize to measure to um, to document. But if you've got goals related to what you're saving from labor and and, and all the you know, elements that go into processing a, mm -hmm. a requisition purchase right. order invoice. And if, if both sides are meeting those goals, that's one way to do it. And then also, you know, add in that rebate element. So you, know, you can have both, but I don't want to just focus on one piece when we're talking about the convenience and the advantages of, of cards, you have to also look at what you're saving there. But, you know, I, I see organizations booking rebates at a high level it could be shared. There could be even just a bonus put in place, you know, right. saying, hey, if, if procurement AP, if you can meet these goals, onboarding suppliers using cards, maybe you get a 500 or whatever the, uh, you know, pound or euro equivalent is uh, bonus at the end of the year or something to that effect. But um, I've seen cases, but not a lot of them where um, AP or whoever got to, they didn't get the money, but they got to spend it. So for example, uh, somebody got to go to a conference, they used it to pay for the conference or uh, to a, attend an online event or for a, 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 so a AP association membership, something like that. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Mary. I think the, again, I've seen something similar. So um, where, where the money goes to, obviously, it always goes into some sort of mythical central pot, and then it gets distributed out by budget usually. Um, but I think you know the point that that I'm that I'm getting from both of you is ultimately it's all almost of having a strategy up front of using the P card for the greatest benefit, and then along the benefits will come maybe the rebates, etc. So it's and that collaboration thing that Lynn just mentioned was, you know, it's it goes back to the thing that you and I have spoken many a time about, Mary's having uh, overlapping KPIs and strategies about what are you going, for, what is the supplier onboarding process? What suppliers are you using? Are they the right type of suppliers? Um, if they're not willing to give you, you know, rebates for, you know, upfront payments, as we would call them in the UK, are they the right type of suppliers? You know, there's lots of things that you would probably have to 
think about before you even engage with the supplier. So I think it's a, a strategic bit you've got to think about. I think the collaboration with our folks over in procurement will definitely be a positive. But again, if I think if those organizations or um, departments start to work in less siloed environments, so they've got the same end goal, then they'll get the true benefits of things like um, you know, procurement cards, virtual cards, you know, whatever type of card they've, they've got. Um, because again, if they're just using cards because they just want rid of the, the noise and the, the low value stuff, and they don't really value all the things that come with it, you know, the in, the reduction in fraud and the visibility and the lack of, you know, the, the improvement in the processes, you've got to go in it the right way. And I think that's what, what I'm some hearing. And for, from a UK standpoint and a Europe point of view, I just, I go back to my earlier point, I think it's an educational thing. I really do. I think if we were to educate both businesses, suppliers, mm -hmm. internal, external teams on the real benefits, I think there'll be more uptake. And again, I think the, the issue that we have in the UK, and I think Mary mentioned this was, you know, I think there's a reluctance because they like the old way of doing things. You know, definitely in the US, it's the checks, the manual bits of paper. Uh, we, we've got <clears throat> we've got away from that. But I think it it comes down to a little bit of trust as well. Um, and let's be honest, you know, after the last three years of being trapped away in different environments, I think the trust should be there a little bit better now yeah. where people are training their teams. You must see that, Mary. Working yeah. Here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was just it's funny you mentioned that I was just thinking about whether I want to do a post on this. Um, yes. You know, especially when COVID first hit. Uh, controllers were like, oh, I can't believe our accounts payable department did such a good job. Oh, they proved they could do it. And they, in many, many cases, they looked at AP with a newfound respect. So that was like one of the few good things that came out of that disaster. But then I look at the headlines now and I still see like some of these CEOs saying, I want everybody back in the office and kind of implying that they don't trust their people. And I think that's kind of sad. Do you, do you agree? T totally agree. And again, I, I, look, I think it's I think it's a mix, really. I think, you know, we, we, we've gone down the lane of sort of trust. But, but at the same time, I think uh, you're right there, Mary. I think um, this this hybrid, <clears throat> the virtual working hybrid, I think that's been driven via, you know, the last couple of three years. But actually, I think productivity, you know, I was watching a TV program in the UK earlier where it was one of these big fat cat uh, CEOs saying that in the first 12 months, the productivity went up. And then in the second year of lockdown, product went down. Went down. Um, so he had a black or white opinion. So it was either all good or all bad. And that hybrid work, I think, is a mix where people like different working environments. And again, you know, it's the topic today is obviously all about accelerating payments, making payments easier. Not the word faster, because uh, right. you know, we, we don't like the word, word faster on the basis that that drives fraud or errors. But again, I think, you know, where we where we as a community, uh, the Council Power Procure, uh, Procure to Pay community, we should be focusing our time on all the value add stuff. So if we can make our payments more pr productive and more efficient using things like where, where Lynn comes in really in the cards area, why wouldn't we? And it goes back to my point, being, you know, going back to that thing about let's be rebels and say, why wouldn't you use this rather than should you use it? So Lynn, Mary, look, we're going to wrap things up in a few minutes. So Lynn, any final words before we wrap up today? I mean, again, it's been amazing, by the way, but Lynn, just on, on the whole world of payments and, and uh, virtuals, any other final words for, for today? Well, I think the bottom line is for AP to truly identify where they are struggling the most where they are expending the most energy for the least amount of value, and then prioritizing those things. And I mean, it's just taking the time and, and some organizations just don't want to stop and, and take the time, but take the time to figure out, you know, what problems are you trying to solve and what are the options for solving those problems? You know, don't try to um, perfect something that's already working well, instead really identify where you need to improve because then that's going to benefit not just AP, but the entire organization. Thank you, Lynn and Mary. So can I close with, a, I think it's a funny story. It's kind of a, amusing. Um, so I was listening to a, a credit person talk. This was a, a few years ago when cards were just coming in in a, in a big way. And he was complaining. He's complaining about AP people who call up on the last day that the payment is due and they want to pay with a card. And he's like, fine, we'll take the card. We're just you know, glad to get the money, to be perfectly honest, he said. And then the real insult, they want to know if they can also take the early payment discount. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, <laughs> they can't. But, um, you know, and I thought to myself when I listened to him talk, well, there's somebody who's trying to get real value for their company. But uh, he was, you know, annoyed about having to pay the interchange fee and then he was not giving the early payment discount um, in, in the U.S. And, and I think in Europe, probably not to the same degree, because we were so I don't want to say backward, but we were not as advanced as you were in Europe. We've got a lot of change going on in the payment world. Um, we've got, we haven't really talked about what we call instant payments, payments here. Lynn's done and done for me on um, uh, the AP Now YouTube channel, a number of talks about Zelle and Venmo. There are US um, equivalents, but we also have the Federal Reserve coming out with a new product called FedNow. So, and we had same day ACH, which was a big improvement. So there's lots of change coming. And, um, you know, I see it also uh, coming in Europe. Um, Jamie, I know we're going to talk on Friday um, with some folks about um, mandatory electronic invoicing, which I guess neither of us have yet, but um, I think there will be great interest in it. Um, so lots of change. I think it makes it an exciting time to be an AP. Absolutely. As always, um, brilliant session. Thank you so much to you both. Um, look, today we've learned lots about um, different versions of how to make payments. And I think that's mm -hmm. the important thing. And I'll right. sort of close if I can today that one of the things that Lynn said, and I know Mary's a, a big fan of this, about accounts payable being the lead, taking the lead, um, taking the time to shine. That's what this week's about. You know, it's about highlighting the great work and the efficient work and all the hard work that goes into running accounts payable teams and procurement pay teams around the world. And that, that world, you know, that AP can take the lead. I think this is one of the areas where we really can be at the foresight rather than be at the back end of a process. We can be at the front end of a process. We can really make our decisions very strategic. So, but it all comes down to collaboration, go out and educate yourself. And this is where I'm going to do that shameless plug Go on to AP now. Go and look at the 300, 400 videos that Mary's put, Mary's put out. She has one of the most superb YouTube channels that you can ever go to. And Lynn, tell us all about your business before we yeah. close today. Where and can Lynn they has a has a has a, a blog on her her uh, website that you can read everything you want everything you ever wanted to know about cards. Well, I, I make a lot of education online on my website. Um, a lot of education is free and open to the public. So I just encourage people to check that out. And, and obviously, if you have a you know, specific business need, that's where you know, we can work together you know, on a more consulting level. But I offer lots of education. It's absolutely what I am passionate about because, Jamie, that's exactly what you, you know, are, are trying to encourage people to do. You know, get educated, see what you can do to improve what you're doing internally, and then just take that you know, spotlight and put it on you and, and say, look what I can do if given the chance. Absolutely. Thank you both, ladies, uh, for today. It's been phenomenal. We've got sessions planned throughout the week, so please look out for those. Once again, thank you for the wonderful Mary, wonderful Lynn. We'll end it there. Thank you, for everybody, for watching us live. I've seen lots of people come and go, and everybody's watching the replay. Give us a thumbs up. Go in, right. comment, and I know Mary's going to replay this on your YouTube uh, yes. channel, Mary. So again, watch the video again, make your comments, but most importantly, as it's AP week, get involved in the community. Right, and congratulations to everybody in the Absolutely. AP community because you're the hero. Thank you all, and I'll speak to you again soon.